Uh, welcome everyone to um, the vascular ultrasound uh, webinar, the Pulse on Vascular Disease 2021, and pun is completely intended. Uh, before I introduce our uh, expert uh, speakers from our vascular lab, a brief introduction. Um, I am Omar Islam. I'm the head of the Department of Radiology here at Queen's University and at KHSC. Uh, we have a, um, a lot of participants today, over 140 registrants, so welcome to everyone. Uh, I hope there will be an opportunity for a, for a rich discussion and informative Q&A. Um, so before I introduce our talented group of technologists and uh, physicians, I just want to give everyone a brief, uh, brief background on the new Vascular Lab. So as some of you may know, KHSC has opened a new Vascular Ultrasound Lab as of April, and we are very excited about uh, the opening and want to share that excitement with you here today as well. Uh, we have uh, focused on quality, um, and uh, to that end, we have purchased uh, new equipment for our vascular uh, lab, uh, specifically two new Philips machines. We have physicians who have uh, many years of expertise in vascular ultrasound uh, interpretation, as well as vascular surgery and vascular interventional radiology. We have uh, expert uh, technologists uh, uh, to help us in this as well. And importantly for quality, uh, we also um, uh, want to ensure that there's continuity of care. So we have set up the processes and procedures so that patients who are referred to our vascular lab, um, all their studies are stored on the KGH packs. And that's very important because it allows for ease of access uh, for all physicians and for patients to access their imaging. Um, and if the patient needs to go onwards towards um, either interventional procedure or vascular surgery, then those images are available for the physicians to review and consult on. And importantly, post-procedure, um, we know that um, vascular ultrasound is underutilized in our region. And this new lab affords us the uh, uh, possibility of bringing patients in into the appropriate uh, stream of a truly multidisciplinary pathway uh, following their procedure. So having said that, I'd like to introduce our uh, speakers today. Uh, so first off is Kathy Logan Monroe. You can give a little wave, Kathy. So there's Kathy, Kathy is uh, our uh, charge technologist, senior sonographer. She's been performing ultrasound for 30 years. She's worked in every modality of ultrasound except for echo. Uh, she is uh, our kind of our leader in vascular ultrasound imaging at KHSC. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we have Dr. Emidio Teruli. And Emidio, uh, give a little, uh, let's see there. Yeah, there he is. Uh, so Emidio is uh, one of our interventional radiologists. Emidio joined us here in Kingston in 2018 after completing a fellowship in interventional and vascular radiology, and he is the medical director of the vascular lab. So uh, thank you, Medio. Uh, then we have Dr. Michael Jakob. Uh, Michael Jakob is a vascular surgeon who trained in Ottawa, and he joined KHSC in 2019, and he's got specialized training in advanced aortic reconstruction, uh, venous disease, and thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, additionally, he has obtained a master's degree in medical education, and is actively involved in the medical school and surgical resident training. And last but not least, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Uh, ben Wasari. If you're there, Ben, if you can raise your hand. Uh, so Ben is the associate head in our department and he's the section head of interventional radiology. And he has been uh, uh, a big proponent of establishing this multidisciplinary partnership that radiology and, uh, and the interventional division has undertaken with vascular surgery. And that has allowed us to form a, a true partnership in all aspects of vascular care at KHSC. So thank you, Ben. Okay, um, I'm going to now hand over the floor to, uh, Leave it's Pam. So Pam, if you're just going to make a couple of announcements and then we're going to get started with Kathy. Yep. I just want to say welcome to everybody who is in attendance today. Uh, so just a couple of things. We will be recording this session. So for people that aren't able to attend, uh, I know there are a lot of people who are interested who just weren't able to make it for various reasons. We are going to record this and post it to the Queen's Radiology website. Uh, so that will be available uh, in the next couple of days. 
we will pass the link around as well. So um, you can uh, spread that among your colleagues, um, et cetera. Also in the uh, question and answer box, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them there. And then we will get to them more towards the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, hopefully we will answer everybody's question. Um, but if we don't, we will provide contact information um, that you will be able to ask questions or get in contact with me uh, to, to ask the questions that you have. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy at this point and uh, we'll get started. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Kathy Logan Monroe, the Senior Registered Vascular Sonographer Technologist in the brand new Vascular Ultrasound Lab. I've been in ultrasound for 30 years. Uh, 22 years ago, I became a vascular technologist and completed that training at the Ottawa Civic Hospital under the supervision of their vascular surgeons. I've been at Kingston General Hospital now for 20 years. And the vascular lab opened the beginning of April this year. We've been busy scanning a variety of vascular patients since that day. Um, we're very excited to be working on the newest um, Philips ultrasound machines, and they have an amazing vascular package, imaging package. Along with me are two other experienced sonographers who have cross-trained into the vascular lab setting. Um, now and in the future, we'll be training more sonographers to become registered vascular sonographers. And um, that will be an ongoing endeavor. Um, the lab is lucky to have physicians familiar with vascular interpretation and vascular surgery available to us um, at any time during the scanning day. And that's it for me. Mike, so I guess I just wanted to point out that that was, if you go back one slide just to show our requisition um, to, to everybody, that's, uh, yeah. So that's our uh, requisition to kind of uh, facilitate and uh, display everything that we have um, uh, available. It's got our contact information there as well. This is also available on our uh, website. If you go to the next uh, two slides. And then this uh, is a preview. If you uh, prescribe to the Ocean uh, online uh, system, this uh, also automatically interfaces with uh, many uh, EMR uh, systems. So if you happen to be on Ocean, you can also use uh, this online version um, to, uh, to get a requisition uh, to us. Next slide. And now I will let uh, uh, Dr. Jakob um, uh, get started and look at uh, basically an update on all forms of vascular disease and how we can uh, help you manage your patients. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Emilio. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Looks like we have 80 participants here. It's a great turnout so far. I'm going to crack on because I think Emilio and I, we uh, we created a juicy set of slides for you guys and we really want to get through everything. So we'll crack right into it now. Um, so I trained in Ottawa and then I went to Ireland actually for medical school. So they have this really nice look in medical school. But if anyone's ever been overseas, they know that Ireland uh, is, is no more for than just that. And, you know, maybe med school was great. Maybe it was a lot of partying. Who knows? I'm not going to let anyone know. But then I went back to the Ottawa Civic Campus, and that's where we really trained vascular surgery. And that's where, where things got really um, heavy. But anyone that's worked in Ottawa knows that it's really a gold standard uh, vascular institute. So I'm very proud to have trained there and proud to have brought some of that knowledge back to Kingston. So what do we do in vascular surgery? Um, it's basically everything under the sun with the, with the word artery, vein, and lymphatics in it, actually. Um, so a lot of people didn't know that we have this really broad uh, scope of practice, but we, we definitely do. And especially with the advent of endovascular surgery in the year 2000, we actually started getting into radiation safety. Um, so everyone's been a lot more mindful of that as well. So that's really, it's come under uh, everyone's umbrella. Um, so what we really do in vasculars, this is what my, my buddy, my, my mom thinks I work in an office job because she'll call me up at noon and be like, hey, let's go for a two-hour lunch. And any doctor out there knows that's basically impossible. Um, this, is, uh, this is what my wife thinks I do. She, she thinks it's the reason I ignore her at all hours of the day. And this is what all my buddies think I do. Um, but the reality is what we do in vascular is we, we line up at these pre-COVID Tim Hortons and we, uh, we see patients like this, and I think everyone's familiar with this patient. And you look, yeah, you take one look at this guy, and you're like, yeah, that's going, that's going to Jakob. Um, so, you know, it's these guys that are smoking diabetics, and, 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 and they really have very end-stage PVD. And that's, that's actually what the majority of what we see in clinic. 
An interesting statistic a lot of people didn't know about is only about one in 10 consults that I see actually translates into an operation. And about nine out of 10 is pure risk factor modification, smoking cessation, exercise. So it's not often that you, you actually convert to an operation in vascular surgery. And that's actually nationally, only about five to 10% of what we see actually becomes an operation. Um, so some interesting facts about what we're doing at Queen's. Um, we never shut down our clinics during the pandemic. Um, the thing with vascular surgery is you always have to feel pulses. Um, so we never had the luxury of being able to do virtual in, uh, in, in lockdown. Um, so we always saw patients, we just gowned up head to toe and felt pulses. Something that Dr. Dr. Zelt and I uh, started is we started doing e-consults. Um, that's just to help uh, basically you guys and everyone out there um, answer some of the soft questions that you don't necessarily think warrants an actual consult, but something that maybe we can clarify as specialists. So if you want some local opinions, uh, Zalt and I are now available all the time for e-consults. So that's a good example in brackets there. What do you do with a 3.5 centimeter saccular AAA, right? You've never seen the word saccular. Is that something? And sometimes it even says recommend vascular consult. Something soft like that. You just send it our way through e-consult. We're, we're happy to take a look. So what do we do in vascular? Well, it's the big four, PVD, cerebrovascular disease, aneurysms, and venous disease. And I'll jump right into PVD. So <clears throat> peripheral vascular disease is actually not a diagnosis. And a lot of people don't realize that, but it's a, it's a huge umbrella term. Anything that is not core is peripheral. Um, anything vascular, arterial arteries or veins is, is technically PVD. So even entrapment syndromes like popliteal entrapment is technically PVD. Now, no one ever refers it to that in an academic setting. We, we refer to PVD and PAD as the same thing, peripheral arterial disease. Um, so really we're referring to peripheral arterial disease whenever you hear the term PVD. Um, so when we go down to the road of PVD, you know, the very classic symptomatology is intermittent claudication. Um, so this is, you know, very common in the practices that uh, in the participants uh, that are, are in this meeting today. You get calf, thigh, buttock cramping only on ambulation. So if these patients do get it uh, after a long car ride or waking up at night from this, it's very, very seldom a vascular etiology. Um, so when they're ambulating, when they're walking, especially not jogging or running, walking is really what exacerbates the calves. Um, it, that's a very classically vascular claudication. It's persistent and reproducible. It always happens every time they walk. It's alleviated by three to five minutes of rest and it's definitely not position dependent. So that, that helps us strongly with the uh, differential diagnosis. The next step of claudication, when 95% of claudicants um, go, usually are stable and then 5% go on to something called critical limb ischemia. That's where it gets really serious. The forefoot night pain, rest pain and tissue loss. That's the classic triad. You look at any of these three, no palpable pedal pulses, you're looking at critical limb ischemia. The picture I put on the right is a very important picture because this helps me differentiate the diabetics. So a lot of diabetics have neuropathy. You can't, they don't have forefoot night pain, rest pain, and they got this little ulcer. You don't know if it's arterial, you don't know if it's diabetic. I always do Berger's test. Berger's test, you elevate the leg, you have the patient lay down, you elevate the leg, you let it drain out for a minute, and then you, you sit them up and you look, for, look at their foot. When you elevate their leg, their foot goes ghostly white, like on the picture on the left. And then on the right, you'll see uh, what happens when you put their foot back down. Very classic dependent ruber. Um, so that's a very good sign that someone has critical limb ischemia. And that's what I use often for my diabetic patients. It's, it's pretty pathognomonic. Something that's important to note that swelling is not a symptom of PVD. It's, we see it often in our referrals and often in the ultrasound requisitions. Um, it, is a, it is a symptom of venous disease. Um, so you are looking at the right system, just the wrong direction of flow. So um, just keep in mind that swelling, it simply isn't a symptom of PVD. So I just wanted to bust that myth uh, early on in the discussion. Uh, physical examination pearls. If you have palpable pedal pulses, you've effectively ruled out PVD as a differential diagnosis. My job as a vascular surgeon is to take a pulseless foot and give it a pulse. So if you do your examination on someone and they have a pulse, they, you're better than what I can do for them. Um, so they, they effectively don't have PVD. So a single palpable pedal pulse in the world of ulcerations is all you need to heal an ulcer. So keep that in mind too. If you can feel a, a dorsalis pedis, but you cannot find a PT, you'll likely still heal the ulcer. A palp single palpable pedal is all you need. Um, palpable pulses is not the same as a Doppler signal. If you cannot feel a pulse, but you can hear it with a Doppler, that is PVD. You should be able to feel a pulse. Everything should be able to be palpated. Um, if you're not sure about pedals, do that Berger's test I mentioned. It's very strongly correlated with critical limb ischemia. And anybody that has absent pedal pulses and an ulcer, that's critical limb ischemia. We should see them all right away. 
So next up is ultrasound. You know, everyone's familiar with ABI. Some people do this in their office, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so you get these, you know, you look up these tables, you always see these ranges and they say, oh, this is what the interpretation is. Well, that's what the real interpretation is. Anybody with less than an ABI of 0.9 up to basically 0.4 is gonna have intermittent claudication, very classically. Anybody less than 0.4, you're now in the territory of critical limb. You may have seen some of my notes saying, well, this patient's ABI is 0.41. I'm going to see them every six months from now on because I think they're going to break down into an ulcer at some point because uh, that's how close uh, and how much of a brink I think they're on. Um, so let's just keep that in mind when you do see ABIs. Really, you don't have to get too obsessed about moderate, mild, and severe. Really, it's clotic versus critical limb. Natural history of atherosclerosis. So like I said, 95% of the claudication patients we see they'll be fine. They'll either improve, stay the same, or worsen a little bit, but they won't progress to critical limb ischemia. There is 5% that will progress to critical limb, and that's the majority of my practice, 80% of every vascular surgeon's practice. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to intermittent claudication, non-operative management is the standard of care. It's a gold standard. Everyone in Canada practices this way. Um, we do consider surgery in some of these patients. So if someone has all the risk factors modified, they're not smokers and they insist on an operation because their life is debilitated, we'll fix them. The other people I fix, even if they're not super well optimized, are the people that depend on their walking economically. If they can't go to work and they're going to go on disability, I'm going to, I'm going to do something for them so they can continue working. Um, that being said, you always have to initiate smoking cessation, exercise, and medical management on all of them. So the world doesn't agree with that opinion. Um, so us, as Canadians, we say, well, you know, the natural history of disease doesn't support aggressive early intervention with intermittent claudication. The Germans say, actually, if you hold back someone from getting treatment from intermittent claudication, you hold back their cardiac health. And if you hold back, they're going to have an MI, you have to stent everybody. Um, and then the Americans say, well, if I don't do it, someone else will, right? And then there's a, it's a huge issue in, 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 in below the border for treatment of intermittent claudication. They're hyper aggressive about it. Um, so if you just picture an artery, the femoral artery is about the same diameter of one of, these, uh, one of these pens and a coronary artery is probably the tip of the pen. So whenever I see someone who has an occluded superficial femoral artery, I always tell them, I'm like, your heart is going to, you're going to have a heart attack soon. I, I guarantee it to them. I said, if you've blocked off an artery that big, you can imagine what's going on in the coronaries. So that's statistically supported as well. There's a major overlap in all these patients. And that's a, a huge trial which demonstrated that. So everything we do in vascular has an expiration date. Um, a peripheral stent is two to five years if we're lucky, an SFA stent, a popliteal or tibial, we, we hope they get to two to five years. A femoral bypass is less than five years, an aortic bypass less than 10 years, and you divide it by two if you have a smoker. So smoking, just it attacks everything we do in vascular and IVR. It really just it, it destroys every little bit of uh, achievement we've had. Um, most of our claudicants, so let's put this in perspective, most of the claudicants are age 50 to 60. And now I'm giving them an SFA stent, which I know is gonna last five years. Then they go back to smoking and now it's two and a half years, right? So thrombosis of the stent is guaranteed in their lifetime. Um, if they're at 50 to 60 and they're getting an SFA, something is gonna happen. Um, so, and if it does happen, I'm hoping they go back to claudication, but sometimes they go worse, they become critical limb or they even lose their leg. So a dramatic conversation we have with some of these people we're trying to convince to smoke is, is walking comfortably for a few years really worth the risk of losing your leg? because that is the worst outcome possible for one of these stents going down or one of the bypasses going down. Um, so let's talk about critical limb ischemia. That's serious. That's, someone we, that's something we have to intervene on everybody. Uh, limb loss is imminent without intervention. If they have rest pain, night pain, they got less than two legs before they lose, two years before they lose their leg. And then uh, tissue loss, they have less than six months before they lose their leg. So stuff we, stuff we admit from clinic all the time is, is critical limb. Uh, we have to, of course, immediately manage the risk factors. And at the end of the day, we're just plumbers, right? So an artery is the same as a rusted, rusted tube, right? Either I can do a bypass or I can do a stent, or we can do a combination of both. And if we can't do it, then they get an amputation or palliation, right? So it's just, what do we do to get around a broken tube? And that's what uh, vascular and IR are really good at. We're really good at finding creative ways to get around blocked up, uh, blocked up arteries. Um, so risk factors for, for peripheral vascular disease, everyone's very familiar with this. It's just worth uh, pointing out diabetes and smoking. Look at the odds ratio for both of those. If you have a diabetic smoker, there's, there's no joking around with those guys. They're, they're headed towards bad news. 
Uh, medical management is very simple. It's the vascular uh, triad. It's the enterocoded aspirin, antilipid, antihypertensive, whatever you like, as long as those are well controlled. There's a new regimen on the horizon. Uh, we just had our vascular national conference this weekend, and there was a, a, a poll that went out. How many people are using ASA plus low-dose Seralto? It was 90% of people. So you will start seeing this funny combination of low-dose Seralto BID dosing. Um, I'm not plugging that. I'm just telling you that you may see that in, in, in circulation sometime soon for P PVD. So uh, when and when, uh, this is really what you came here for, when and what to order at the vascular lab, right? So if you expect lower, if you suspect low extremity arterial disease, order the low extremity arterial duplex. Just realize an ultrasound is for diagnosis and a CTA is for treating. So we in vascular and IR, we're the ones getting the CTAs to fix something because we're trying to plan the hybrid, trying to plan the operation, but the ultrasound is what we need to start that process. You only get to skip the ultrasound if someone now has ulcers and gangrene. Skip the screening step, you have your diagnosis. You have the ulcers and gangrene and you can't feel pulses in the feet. That's something we should see in clinic, next available clinic, and we'll probably admit them from the clinic or get them scanned or uh, fixed within one to two weeks. We really don't wait with these patients. We're quite aggressive at Kingston trying to, trying to save some legs here, especially if they come that, uh, they come that late stage. This is what our rec looks like. And so just to give you an, a real live example to what we do with a PVD patient, we use zoom into vascular upper extremity, uh, ultrasound extremity. We literally just check off legs, left, right, ABIs, and then claudication, and then you're done. And you sign the bottom. So those are the two options right there. So the rec is ready to go for you. So when to refer vascular surgery for PVD. So the claudication one is an interesting one. The majority of our consults, like I said, are claudication or, or PVD consults in general. Um, the guys we, we like to see are the ones that are really economically dependent on walking and they have an ABI of less than 0 0.9. Those are people we can really fix. Now I put in bold the truth of what we actually do with these people. So the truth is we will conservatively manage everyone. We have to, that's the, the standard of care. Um, so anybody from 0 0.7 and 0 0.9, we're, we're doing purely uh, conservative therapy because it's not really severe just yet. Um, retired patients with claudications guys, like that is super common. People will retire, they'll start walking with their spouses these huge distances because they're bored and suddenly they're getting intermittent claudication. You know everyone sees it in, in their clinics, right? It's incredibly common. It's really hard for us to justify treating a retired patient because they don't really have a reason to have an SFA stent or a fem pop. That's a really big operation and a big endeavor um, to treat for someone who's just doing it for leisure reasons. Um, so just kind of think twice before you send someone who's retired and kind of inconvenienced by it. We still fix them, but they have to be really debilitated. They have to accept the fact that they can lose their limb from something going very wrong. Um, we will fix it, someone who's smoke-free, who's working or really debilitated and has no other major medical issues. That is someone we will consider fixing for sure. You have to, of course, refer all critical limb ischemia patients, the four foot night pain, rest pain, tissue loss. The ABI is less than 0.45. I actually follow those guys even if they have no symptoms. Um, I'm afraid they're gonna develop an ulcer. I'll see them every six months for the rest of their life. And I'll educate them every six months. And this is what I'm looking for because I don't want them to, to break down. And I've caught people in my clinic breaking down, not noticing it. And they've, they've developed an ulcer on their toe and they had no idea. And it was only the clinic that caught it. Um, and any diabetic patient with ulcers and non-palpable pedal pulses, something you'll see in your, um, in your practice, especially if you order these ultrasounds, you might see monophasic waveforms in the tibial vessels. That's a bit of a red flag for us, actually. So they'll always, almost always, you've seen it. It's frustrating. Oh, incompressible vessels and ultrasound. But what if you look at the if you look at the description, they say, oh, monophasic waveforms and tibials. That's actually quite serious. That means there's not enough flow going to the tibials, and they have an ulcer. That's someone we should see. That's someone that's actually might be in trouble. And then, of course, serial serious tissue loss. Just refer to us right away without an ultrasound delay. So some housekeeping on CT angiograms, just the, the best practice is to not order a CTA at all. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up, I know you guys often don't want to order the CTA. And, I, and I've spoken to a lot of my buddies just in my neighborhood who are family doctors. And they tell me this all the time saying, look, we get this ultrasound rec back. And at the bottom, it says recommend CTA before saying, oh, we'll send to vascular, ask to vascular. But everywhere else in the country, it's saying refer to vascular. We don't know where this culture came from. But please ask us. We're happy to intervene in the middle, especially if we can prevent someone from getting a CT scan. I think the patients are pretty grateful if we can intercept that. Um, so they do get upset. I've seen a few patients in clinic who are like, why the hell did I get a CT scan if you weren't ever going to fix me? And they're upset at me because <laughs> like, well, why why'd you order the CT? I'm like, well, you know, it actually showed up before I got here. And I, I don't pin the blame on anyone. I'm just saying, well, you know, they're trying to be extra cautious. So they ordered the CT. 
But the reality is you don't need to order the CTA. CTA is just for planning purposes only. So behind the curtains, after we operate on someone, we use, just like Dr. Islam mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we use ultrasounds to, to follow our patients for the rest of their life. Um, it's lifelong surveillance on everything we do. Um, so we actually arrange this. I'm not going to talk about this in, the, in this uh, talk. It's a heavy talk already. And you don't need to be aware of it, but just be aware. There's they're going to get ultrasounds for the rest of their life after we, we bypass or stent them. So then I'll turn it over to Emilio. Thank you, Mike. So this is just a classic uh, example of a patient referred for left leg claudication. And what I just want to highlight here is how much good information we get from uh, high quality ultrasound. And that's why we're lucky to have great sonographers because they can give you pictures like this. And then the job of the uh, physician who's interpreting this is very easy. On the right, that SFA, that's a completely normal waveform. It's multiphasic. It's high resistance. Um, the velocity is completely appropriate. Looking at their left leg, this is their symptomatic leg. Um, the main difference is with that waveform. Number one, it's not a clean a signal. You have lots of velocities going all the way from um, very low velocity to up to that peak systolic velocity, six meters per second. So you have spectral broadening. You have focally increased velocity within the vessel at the area of stenosis. Um, and basically we've, we've identified a very significant stenosis. It's probably moderate to severe stenosis this is, has the uh, potential for going on um, to occlude. The other thing that the normal waveform tells us on the right, sorry, Mike, is that upstream of that, in order to, for you to have a normal waveform at that point of your SFA, that means from your aorta to your common iliac to your external iliac, all of that is flowing uh, nicely. And when we see that abnormal waveform on the other side, we already know now that the problem is probably isolated uh, to the SFA. If we could go to the next slide. So not uncommonly, this is what will happen, that uh, stenosis will progress to an occlusion. So on the far left, that's a CTA, which is showing the area of occlusion. Uh, so now we know exactly how, um, how long it is, what size of stent we might need potentially. Uh, the middle image is showing how uh, we basically have to get down there with uh, catheters and wires, cross the occlusion. And then the image on the right uh, shows a stent that has been used to basically reopen uh, this occluded um, vessel. Next slide. So uh, this is another example of a uh, longer occlusion. We can tell that this has been there actually longer based on all those uh, huge collaterals that are present uh, that are connecting uh, the road from the profunda again to the SFA. Um, but these collaterals are often insufficient to provide um, you know, the, the flow that is required uh, specifically for walking or anything like that. Um, so often we will, uh, uh, when we're successful, the panel in the middle is showing a successful recanalization of that fairly long occlusion and the insertion um, of a stent. And I just show that to you because we have the follow-up, and this is where the ultrasound comes in on the next slide. Um, so here's a beautiful exam. This was done by Kathy. And it actually shows um, the image on the top. That's a B-mode image, a composite of that entire length of stent within that, um, within that SFA, and then the waveform all the way along. So this is how we can monitor uh, this stent and this vessel that we've worked hard to reopen so that if it starts going down, there are things that we can potentially do uh, before it's thrombosis and then the, you know, the patient uh, gets into trouble. And uh, this final slide, again, a little bit um, uh, more of the same, just showing uh, on, on the far left, a CTA, which shows a right SFA stenosis and that waveform is over in panel D. Uh, the red arrow on the uh, far left is actually showing a um, hard to see because of the large uh, field of view. That's an occluded common iliac that in the panel B, we've gone and uh, recanalized that and stented it. And then uh, your follow the uh, follow-up ultrasound in C is showing that now you've reestablished a normal waveform in the external iliac artery. And that's actually downstream from where we put the stent. So this is how an ultrasound, even though the ultrasound can rarely actually look at that common iliac stent, if we're able to look at the left external iliac and we have a normal uh, waveform like that, we're very confident that that stent is open. We don't have to go and subject them to more CTAs or so on uh, to make sure that that stent is open. Thanks, Mike. I think you're still muted. I think we just wanted to pause here to see if there were any uh, burning questions, if Pam had any questions to bring forward. Uh, so Jeff Sloan, eh? Yeah, Jeff Sloan had a question. Should asymptomatic diabetic patients have ABIs? If so, when and how often? Yeah, no, not really. So. 
if, if you can feel palpable pedal pulses, so diabetics don't necessarily, they're not necessarily doomed to PVD. If you can feel palpable pedal pulses, you never have to ultrasound them. If you lose palpable pedal pulses, um, you don't have to keep surveillancing them. That's not necessarily a thing because actually you're, like we said, you probably get non-compressible ABIs. But if they, the, the minute you start sensing they're developing tissue loss or an ulcer or something, that's when you take it seriously. You send them for the vascular ultrasound saying, oh, well, he's starting to get these bad calluses that are eroding. I wonder if he has PVD. I can't feel pulses. Um, so surveillance for diabetics asymptomatics, I wouldn't do that. Um, but once you start getting any breakdown, that's when you're like, well, okay, we gotta, we gotta go down this road. So palpable pedal pulses is all you need for, for diabetics. Um, and then Violet Gonzalez said, if ultrasound every six months or yearly and follow up after surgery, oh, is ultrasound every six months or yearly after surgery? Yeah, great question. It depends how, um, um, okay, the long story short, say I do a bypass, there's a very intense, uh, uh ultrasound surveillance that I arrange It's three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. And if everything looks beautiful in those four ultrasounds, then it's yearly. Um, some of my colleagues will do six months, then yearly. And sometimes they see them in clinic at six months and yearly because they want to physically see the, the bypass on the legs. Um, so, so the answer to that question, if the bypass is behaving appropriately, it's every year. Um, that's the long story short for those two. Any other question? <clears throat> okay crack on to CVD. Um, so cerebrovascular disease, it's another one of these terms that's a massive umbrella term. Um, so you got extracranial and intracranial disease. Um, in vascular ultrasound, we only deal with uh, uh, extracranial disease. So what that really means is this little picture down here. Those bones right there is basically the jaw. And everything under the jaw is what we can actually image. So the vertebral arteries, the subclavian arteries, the carotid arteries, and that's called extracranial cerebrovascular disease. So anything outside of the skull, the ultrasound is really good at picking up. There is stuff we can do in the skull, but we're not quite equipped for that yet. And it's actually quite hard to interpret as well. Um, so that's really outside of the scope of what we're doing just now. Um, for this presentation and basically all your independent learning, whenever you heard the term CVD, it's almost always referring to the carotid artery stenosis for some reason. Again, it's one of these weird historical things. Um, just keep in mind that it is actually a much bigger umbrella term to refer to everything going to the brain. Um, so what's the point of carotid intervention? Very, very important. The product of carotid surgery or stenting is to prevent future stroke events. Um, so it's therefore, by definition, a prophylactic procedure. What it will not do is have someone recover faster or regain function. Okay, so that's a really important thing to, to describe to the patients. And it's never indicated when the carotid is already 100% blocked off. So the damage is already done. The only exception to this, of course, is coat strokes. When someone comes in coat stroke, acutely thrombos carotid, that's a different situation. But if you have a stable outpatient ultrasound that shows that the carotid is 100% occluded, the patients walk around no issues. That's not something that requires carotid surgery or stenting ever. Um, so what, what is the definition of someone who's symptomatic and asymptomatic? So I'm, I made this table myself to try to Keep it really simple. So if you compare symptomatic to asymptomatic, the time frame, if someone's had an event within three months, they're defined as symptomatic. If they had no new events after three months, they're actually swapped and they're defined as asymptomatic. Um, stenosis to operate, the Canadian standard is greater than 60% for symptomatic, greater than 80 for asymptomatic. Some things to be aware of, um, someone who has a disastrous stroke, their brain is too damaged to have a surgery. Um, so we actually delay it if possible. Um, and another thing about a major stroke is if they actually have a completely devastating stroke with nothing recoverable, well, there's no point of doing a prophylactic surgery if there's nothing to save. And then, of course, it's very, very important. The biggest decision for carotid artery surgery versus stenting is do they have active coronary artery disease? If they have active coronary artery disease, they're not going to like me clamping their carotid. So this is a person that's a really good stent candidate. Um, as it stands, stenting is only appropriate if not surgically appropriate. That, I think that's going to shift very soon with some of the new data. I think it's going to be a bit more 50-50 rather than so dogmatic. And everyone has to be on dual antiplatelet for medical management. When we go down the road of asymptomatic disease, this is where it gets really sticky. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to belabor this too much. It is stuff you're going to see a lot in your clinic. You're going to, you're going to do a carotid scan and some, suddenly it's going to come back and you got 60% bilateral stenosis. And you're going to want to refer to us for vascular consult. We're happy to see all of them, but just realize what's the conversation we're about to have with them, okay? So the world disagrees with what we should do with asymptomatic carotid surgery. So if you actually look at the trial, what we could do is we can reduce their annual stroke risk from 2% a year to 1% a year. 
that's not a big drop. But if you have someone you think is going to live 10 years, that's a huge effect, right? So our Canadian and actually most of the world, what we believe is, well, if you have someone who's got greater than 80% stenosis, a good life expectancy, a good heart, and the surgeon isn't bad, then we recommend medical management, but we can consider them for surgery. This is what the Australians, everyone, that's what everyone recommends. They do our European Union, uh, and then uh, the Americans, not so much. Uh, they think, well, you know, 2% to 1% is like saying 50% reduction. So we operate on everybody. Um, and it's actually, it's actually a bit of a serious issue to the point where it got into journals. Um, and it's saying, you know, why, are, why are we doing this? The data does not support aggressive asymptomatic carotid surgery. You really got to have a good candidate before offering it. But then again, you know, this is the reason I point out some of this ambiguity to this talk is just when you go to Google something and when you go to look at data yourself, Keep in mind, there's a massive cultural difference between the world and the United States, and the United States is publishing a lot. So just be careful, just be aware of it, and be mindful that the American medical system is a little more um, uh, doggy dog than than the medicine should support. Um, so when and uh, what and when to order an ultrasound? Um, a high priority scan is anybody who's had a neurological event that you suspect is secondary to cerebrovascular disease. A low priority scan is some a screening study. Say they had a coronary event and you want to screen other vascular beds, that's something certainly warrants a carotid scan. Surveillance of already known cerebrovascular disease, you're waiting for it to get to 80% to refer to vascular. And then subclavian stenosis. So if you have a BP discrepancy in the office and you think it's secondary to subclavian occlusion, if you really wanted to investigate it, that's a low priority scan. The reality is we're not gonna do anything with that information. So you should only be referring subclavian stenosis if they have subclavian steel syndrome. And that's the real indi indication to, to, to send them for an ultrasound. So there's the subclavian steel syndrome. Um, this is again, jumping back to the rec and what, what the actual steps are to actually do this. You plug off carotid arteries and then there's all your indications, the neuro indications on the right, right? So, and you can write in TIA if you want to be specific. So it's really easy. Uh, the, the rec has made it super simple. I know I use this for my practice all the time. So I really do like the rec. Um, when to refer to us urgent is if they've had focal neurological event and their ultrasound shows greater than 60% stenosis. We, we see those guys actually, we triage that within 14 days. They're seen very quickly. Um, we have a pretty high priority triage for these type of cerebral vascular events. The non-urgent ones are asymptomatic greater than 80, subclavian steel syndrome, anything that is weird. Uh, sometimes they get vertigo and you don't know why they got vertigo and they have some asymptomatic cross-mosis. We'll take a look at those guys too, just to reassure everyone that it's probably not cerebrovascular disease. Um, again, not necessary is anything with asymmetric uh, uh, BP. Say so you do have a subclavian artery occlusion that you confirmed on ultrasound. All that information does for you is confirm that your personal clinical practice should measure BP in the contralateral limb. And you should just document that within your own EMR, that BP should be reliably taken, especially if you're doing, you know, antihypertensive monitoring. Um, you're going to want to avoid the subclavian occlusion arm. Um, but that's, that's more for your own practices rather than warranting um, a vascular surgery consult. Medical management is the of asymptomatic disease, you know, classic vascular cocktail, aspirin, antilipid, antihypertensive. Um, so the question, and this is, this is, I'm skipping the surgery and the intervention part, um, because you guys are going to see the after breath. You're going to see the after carotid endor, the after carotid stenting, uh, and the stenting program here has grown quite substantially. So you guys are going to see a lot more carotid stent patients. So do I need an order ultrasound after a carotid endor directomy? No, not at all. Uh, the natural history of uh, re stenosis of a carotid endor is very benign. Almost nobody strokes out afterwards. So we actually don't surveillance them. And do I need to order ultrasounds after a carotid stent? Yes. Um, so we usually take care of that, um, but be aware that a stent is a different than an endart. A stent can get neontomal hyperplasia at the two ends of it, and it can actually cause a new event, um, but we can actually prevent that by monitoring it with a stent, uh, by, by monitoring um, uh, post, uh, post stenting. Um, historically, people didn't and people actually still monitor the carotids after endarterectomy. So some of my colleagues still do that. There's nothing against it, but it's also not 100% necessary. So I'll, I'll drop it off to Emilio. Thank you, Mike. So uh, this slide is just basically to showcase what uh, carotid Doppler um, is all about. In the uh, top left, panel A, B-mode image in two planes simultaneously. We have probes that are capable of doing this now. Uh, and it does show eccentric uh, plaque. But the real information comes in panel B which shows the actual, uh, the waveform 
and the uh, flow velocities. That actually is not a significantly stenosed uh, carotid. That velocity is well below 125, which would be the uh, upper limit um, of normal. So uh, this is not, this is definitely a less than 50% stenosis. The two panels at the bottom are just to show some uh, flow imaging and some uh, partial kind of real-time 3D imaging that is uh, capable now with these uh, 3D probes. I just wanted to show off what, what uh, we can do. Uh, more information coming in the next slide. So uh, this, I think, alludes to one of the questions that I just saw pop up uh, on the chat. So yeah, there are uh, task forces in the U.S. that have gone and said, you know what, screening for asymptomatic carotid uh, artery stenosis in, uh, in low-risk people is can cause more harm uh, than benefit. And I think that we would agree. We don't think we don't need to be screening the uh, general population for uh, carotid stenosis, um, especially when it's you know less than uh, sixty percent. Intervening on that is not uh, has not been shown. Uh, to be beneficial. Can we go to the next slide? So there, these are actually the uh, indications when we would say um, what's appropriate in terms of our uh, surveillance. So this is the asymptomatic carotid stenosis that's been discovered. The only situation where it's appropriate uh, to be um, uh, following this is if it's you know greater than 70% or it looks like it's something that could go on uh, to occlude or cause uh, a neurologic um, event. And uh, I just put those up there for a completion, but basically we try and follow these guidelines if we're going to recommend uh, uh, surveillance after uh, the first uh, study. And this is just uh, to allude to what uh, Mike was saying, um, after carotid intervention, uh, it's also, it's about monitoring uh, the side that's intervened on, whether it's a stent or an endoarterectomy, but also uh, chances are they have disease on the other side, and you don't want to uh, allow that to progress um, without uh, without catching it uh, in time. Next slide. So this, you know, I, I want you to look at that top left image. That, so that's the proximal ICA, which does not look all that different than the one that I just showed you. However, what is very different is the actual uh, spectral uh, velocity and the waveform in the bottom uh, left there. So that peak systolic as well is in the 300s. Um, so this is definitely a greater than 70% uh, stenosis. I rotated that B-mode image uh, in, the, in the center of the panel there and put the CTA right beside it, basically to show off how good carotid ultrasound is now uh, at showing you the actual anatomy of that uh, plaque. So you can see the bifurcation of the external internal. You can see beautifully, you can see the plaque. We can estimate a stenosis here very, um, very well and it correlates very well with the, uh, the CTA. So this is a patient that definitely would get referred on um, uh, to vascular surgery to see what the most appropriate uh, next intervention would be. Thanks, Mike. That's a great uh, picture, Emilio. Uh, just to some of the, the participants here, I just wanna point out the fact that only about 10 to 12 years ago, did vascular surgeons start using CTs routinely for carotid end arts. A, a few of my mentors in Ottawa Actually, the majority of their practice was doing carotid end arts based on ultrasound alone, um, because that's how good ultrasound has always been for carotid disease. Um, so that's just to plug ultrasound a little more is that people actually operated based on ultrasound. Um, now that we have easy access to CTs and most of them are getting it for a stroke protocol anyway, we have the luxury of having it for, for uh, uh, surgery now. Um, but just to point out that th this is all real, right? Like this is not just uh, um, new technology. Ultrasound has always been fantastic for, for carotid disease. Um, so any questions? I think Emilio addressed uh, Jeff Sloan's question there. Okay. I'll crack on to triple A's. Oh, one more. Nice. Uh, Jeanette Dietrich said, what is your feeling on checking carotid dopplers for refining cardiovascular risk estimations? Um, I, I'm actually not, a, uh, I'm not against that. So the reason I'm not against that is because all the data coming out now is all about... Um, someone with polyvascular disease is a different patient than someone who just had an MI. Um, a lot of data has supported that now. So you got this guy with an MI and then you screen every vascular bed and the person who has multivessel disease versus just the MI has a very different natural history. So if you wanna be more aggressive about that post coronary event patient, I think that's reasonable. Um, but should you chase it in someone you can't feel femoral pulses for that's had no events is asymptomatic PVD? I'm not quite sure about that. Um, but definitely someone who's had an event and you want to screen multiple beds, um, I think that's completely reasonable, um, to be honest, because they are a different natural history. 
Um, Ian Silver said the neurologist seems to think that cross diagnosis can only be assessed accurately with CTA, maybe you should have <laughs> Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's, it's funny actually, <laughs> uh, yeah, to, to not stick my foot in a bear trap here. The, um, say someone came in with a 99% to or occluded carotid artery. Um, what we actually do is we send them from CTA to ultrasound because ultrasound has something called power Doppler, which I think a video has a picture of. Um, I think it was a previous, there's a previous, this is a power dollars power. Yeah. These images right here that my cursor is on, it's something called power Doppler. Power Doppler is really good at finding something called trickle flow. The art of the stenosis is so severe that blood is only trickling through all these little grooves to get to the brain. The CTA cannot show that actually the ultrasound shows it. Um, so I actually get, you know, to go back to that, I actually get neurologists calling me being like, Mike, I don't understand. This patient's having recurrent TIAs, but the CTA shows 100% occlusion. What should I do? I say, send them from Doppler, tell them you're looking for a trickle flow, and they're going to do a power Doppler to confirm that it's in fact 99% stenosis, and then I end dart them. Um, so that actually is my politically correct way of answering that, is that even the neurologist kind of bounced back to us being like, the patient's still having symptoms, the CTA shows is occluded, it doesn't make sense to me. We throw them right back into ultrasound. Okay. So next is triple A's. Um, this is, uh, this is actually a shorter uh, part of the talk because it, everyone's pretty comfortable with it because it's such a disastrous outcome if we get it wrong. So everyone's really good with it. Um, so some risk factors for AAA disease. Um, it, it basically, the stars here are, are kind of like the red flag ones. Um, males that are smokers should all have abdo exams. I'm going to get into this a little later. Um, something just for everyone to be aware of, a family degree of AAA is incredibly strong. We're actually shifting our knowledge of AAA to become an inherited disorder rather than an acquired disorder. You wouldn't believe how strong AAA is for family degrees. Every single AAA I, dis, I, I, uh, I talk to, I educate, I do a genetic counseling, every single one. I, I tell them if you have any uh, direct siblings or children, they need to be ultrasounded after the age of 50 because they will develop a AAA. It's like a fire. The description I say, it's like a fire. And if you're a smoker, you're throwing gasoline on that fire and it's going to grow. Um, so that's the way they, they, they actually appreciate that, you know, smoking and aneurysm disease with a family history is, is a real nasty combination. Um, history, I mean, they're asymptomatic, right? If they're symptomatic, they're, they're on their way to me. Um, what you will find is a palpable abdominal mass on examination. You should send them for ultrasound. If you think you can feel it, you're probably feeling it. Send them for an ultrasound. Um, every active smoker over 50 should have regular abdominal examinations. Um, just to show you a little insight to my own practice, if someone comes in with a carotid stenosis or varicose veins, I check their abdomen for a AAA because there's nothing more embarrassing than a, carotid, a vascular surgeon doing a carotid end dart on a 65-year-old smoker, and he ruptures a month later from a AAA that was missed. Um, and it's part of the full vascular exam. So I do it on everyone. I even do it on my varicose veins, and they, they look at me kind of funny. But it's just being thorough and not missing something that's very easily picked up on abdo exam. Um, next is ultrasound guidelines. The CSVS actually just came up with refined ones in 2021. Um, <clears throat> so one-time screening ultrasound for all men aged 65 to 80. Um, this is based on world data. Uh, they worked a really long time to keep in mind the limitations we, we have in resources in Canada, but what all the data has shown in the world. And everybody that's a male over the age of 65 to 80 should get a one-time abdo ultrasound to look for AAA. They also suggest one-time screening for all women who have a history of smoking or cerebrovascular disease. And then another one is if someone's older than 80, you think twice about it. Do you really want to send someone over 80 for a AAA screen? Well, what can we do about it if you find a three and a half centimeter AAA in an 80 year old? We're not going to do anything about it, right? So it, it comes down to, and, and the, the, the document teases this out more, um, it comes down to that patient. Are they a good 80? Are they an 80 going on to 100? Like they're really, like they've got 20 years left in them? Yeah, send them for the ultrasound. Um, One-time screening ultrasound for 55 years and older for first-degree relatives of patients with AAAs. And then the repeat ultrasound, see, the last one is kind of silly. Like how many people have like put in their calendars, do it every 10 years, right? With someone who has 2.5 to 3 centimeters, but there it is. And I just had to put it for completion sake. I think it's ridiculous. I personally couldn't do this in my own practice. Um, so here's an example of, of surveillance guidelines for AAAs. Um, uh, in our vascular lab, at the end of all our abdominal AAA surveillance um, studies, we, we give you what the surveillance protocol is. So you just refer to the bottom of a study and you'll know how frequently you have to order these studies. 
And it, the, I mean, obviously the frequency increases as you get closer to surgical consideration. So when to be concerned about a AAA uh, ultrasound? If it's greater than six centimeters, you should bring that to our attention pretty quickly. Same thing with greater than four centimeters. Send the consult, we will triage it very high. We'll see those guys within two weeks. Any red flag findings on an ultrasound is probably not going to make it to your office. The reason that that's the case is the radiologist will often send the patient to emerge directly. These red, flag, red flags are like fluid in the abdomen, tender aorta or inflammatory changes. They often won't leave that with like, they will call the patient back and send them to emerge or call us in vascular for an opinion on the, on the spot. Um, but just realize these are some of the red flag findings. When not to be concerned, if you see the term dissection in the AAA, or thrombus in a AAA, just realize that is actually what happens to an artery as it gets bigger. That is a normal process, okay? So don't get too concerned about that, especially thrombus in a AAA. There's not a single AAA repair I've ever done that didn't have thrombus in it. Um, so if you are nervous, if you say, you know what, this doesn't make sense, it says dissection into the common iliac or something, send us an e-consult. We'll take a look and we'll, we'll happy to give you an opinion on it and whether or not we want to see it. Uh, so back to the video. Right, so this is just an example of how, you know, we use ultrasound to uh, uh, follow AAAs. Uh, 2017, measuring about three and a half centimeters. Uh, in 2020, now it's uh, up to 4.3, 2021. Um, so now we're increasing the frequency of our uh, follow-up uh, a little bit, but I just wanted to show how um, the ultrasound beautifully shows, well done, it shows the size of the aneurysm, it shows uh, uh, the thrombus, uh, but it's also important to note, the reason I had the coronal image there is that aneurysms, they're not always, uh, you know, perfectly in the axial uh, plane. And if you're getting ultrasounds at different places that either don't, uh, where they don't have the, the prior imaging um, or, the, you know, they're not paying close attention to the change uh, over time. If you cut through a pipe on a slightly oblique angle, all of a sudden you can get measurements that might simulate that something is growing when really it's uh, basically um, stable but it's a simple examination to do and it's uh, very accurate. Um, let me go to the next slide. This I just wanna show for the, uh, the surveillance piece. So this is an aneurysm that was actually treated uh, with endovascular repair. So that's a brand, uh, EVAR graft, which we, uh, we, we do these together here. Um, the image in the top left is showing there's color flow outside of those two little, um, the, those two graphs, the iliac graphs. Um, so this is diagnostic of a, 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 an endoleak. The other thing that tells us that an endoleak or basically there's still pressurized uh, blood in the uh, native sac is that the sac basically should be getting smaller after we treat it over time, um, uh, not larger. Those angio images that uh, we show there, B1 is the, um, we've gone and done an angiogram which shows basically there's a leak from the bottom uh, where that uh, iliac um, graft is supposed to uh, seal and blood is getting around kind of the end of it and flowing back uh, into the aneurysm sac. And then in B2, we've extended that stent and uh, got the seal. And then with our follow-up ultrasound, um, after we've done uh, that angiographic procedure in C, we see, and, and in D, we see that now there's no flow outside uh, the sac anymore. And the measurements would also, you know, support the sac is either stable um, or getting smaller. So ultrasound is great for both diagnosis and very useful for surveillance. Thanks. I think you're muted, Mike, sorry. Yeah, sorry, it's my, apparently it's my first time using Zoom. Um, how accurate would abdoxan be listening for BRI for AAA? Um, so uh, not at all, not at all. Um, the, uh, the AAAs may not produce a BRI. Um, a BRI is produced from turbulent flow and often the thrombus that forms inside an aorta, um, actually Emidio has a perfect uh, CT of that, the thrombus, look at, look at the, this one here, the 2021 scan, the CT. Look at the contrast in the middle of the aneurysm. It's perfectly circular. There is no turbulent flow through this aorta. Therefore, your clinical exam will not produce a brewy. So listening for a brewy as a sign for AAA is completely unreliable. Palpation alone is, is, is the strongest predictor or the strongest uh, finding for it. Um, one of my uh, mentors in Ottawa did a, did a really interesting um, uh, uh, study. He examined the vascular surgeon's physical exam versus a medical student with an ultrasound and whether or not the surgeon picked up more AAAs than the medical student. 
and the medical student with the ultrasound picked up more triple A's. Now, it didn't show that the medical student was a keener or the ultrasound was amazing. It showed you that the abdo exam can burn you. It can make you feel falsely reassured. So please don't feel like we're gonna, we ever blame you guys for missing a triple A on exam. That's not at all the case, but it should be felt at least, uh, at least you know you did the best you could. Um, next question is, are thoracic aneurysms genetic as well? Yeah, completely. In fact, thoracic is more genetic than, than inferenal. Um, if you have someone with a thoracic aneurysm that's under surveillance, we fix them at six centimeters and we're happy to see them all. Um, Jeff said, is how sensitive is abdominal palpation detection AAA in a lean patient? Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. So the skinny guys, you can see their aorta bouncing their belly button, right? Because they're, they're so tiny. Um, this is where I gets a bit fancy, actually. I wonder if I can see myself on the video because I have to show you what my hands are going to do. What I do when I feel the aorta is I put my finger, I uh, push it and you feel the aorta bounce on you, right? What I then do is I stick my two fingers and I put my two fingers on either end of the aorta and I keep moving my fingers away until one of my fingers are no longer bouncing. And then I move it back until they're both bouncing again. That way, the distance between my fingers is how wide on average the aorta is. So if you have a skinny person, you can actually do that trick where you stick your fingers on either end of the aorta and you can just kind of move until you stop feeling the two edges of the aorta. Um, so that's, that's a great way to, that's a great trick uh, on how to do that. And then Anne Keo said, uh, when do you stent versus surgery for a AAA? Uh, can you address thoracic aneurysms and when to intervene? Yeah, surgery versus stenting for aneurysms. The long story short, um, that's a bombshell question that nobody has the answer for, but the long story short is um, we have a conversation with every patient on the risks and benefits of both and we let them decide. Stenting has long-term surveillance. We have to watch them for the rest of their life. Some operations do not need long-term surveillance. Um, and, and you'd be surprised how many patients are really upset to hear that, well, once we do the EVAR, you have to come in for an ultrasound every year for the rest of your life. Some people hate that. Um, and some of the older, younger guys are like, no, I want to be demedicalized. I don't want to stent. I don't want to be followed. And if it's a simple tube repair, they'll get an open AAA. Um, you, the stenting has an incredible recovery. You go home post-op day one. Sometimes you don't even have an incision. So we often, if we see an 80-year-old patient with a great stent anatomy and great open anatomy, we tend to push them towards a little more of a stent uh, direction because we know what it's like for an 80-year-old to recover from an open AAA repair. We know it's going to set them back a year uh, with regards to energy and getting back to life. And we know the stent will be golfing in four weeks, right? So what we do sway the patients in one way or another um, because we know what happens after these repairs. Um, but uh, but there's it's, it's a really big topic actually, and we have long they're almost like cancer conversations. By the way, the thoracic surgeons talking about cancer is like a vascular surgeon talking about triple A. It's a big conversation in clinic. Um, can you address thoracic aneurysms and when to intervene? Yep. Thoracic aneurysms we fix at six centimeters. They can only be uh, uh, surveillance with CT scans. They don't need to be contrast CTs because we just need to measure the outer border of the thoracic aneurysm. So once it hits six, uh, let us know and we'll, we'll fix all of them. Um, and uh, well, we'll try <laughs> to fix all of them. And, uh, and you'd be surprised that some of the thoracic aneurysms connect to the abdominal aorta. And that's something that right now we can't fix. We have to send that to Toronto, um, but we're still the go-to contact people and we'll talk to Toronto and let them know what the complexity of the case. And we usually vet these cases for Toronto to make sure they're not getting uh, something that's a bit too uh, hard to fix. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Okay, so last topic, we're actually doing pretty decent for time, is venous disease. Um, so risk factors for, for venous disease, you got uh, DVTs, varicose veins, family history is huge. Um, I just had a venous clinic this morning and uh, a lot of my 30 year old patients are people that were mom had varicose veins. Um, so why does a 30 year old develop varicose veins, right? It's usually because family history, um, obesity and pregnancy. So family history plus someone who's had kids, they get doomed varicose veins, right? And then uh, smoking actually worsens it. A lot of people didn't know that and extended periods of standing or sitting. So the reason I put that in bold is probably half the people in this um, uh, uh, lecture are gonna be uh, developing varicose veins. And then uh, the gender, it's a lot of majority of my patients are female and people over 50 years old. Um, so some of the classic symptoms, this, this little diagram summarizes it very well. Um, symptoms are absent in the morning, worse at the end of the day. That's very classic. And it's actually very easy for you guys because if you have a patient that's complaining of the symptoms first thing in the morning or at night that wakes them up, it's not varicose veins. Um, varicose veins is you get this heaviness and swelling and pooling of veins in your legs, worse at the end of the day. Very classic, progressively worsens throughout the day. 
Um, the, um, the sequel, the symptoms are never equal. It is constantly confounding. And then starting with a regular compression sock usage can actually alleviate the symptoms. And then eventually they get through the, to get to the point where even the compression isn't working anymore. Um, what does it look like on exam? We actually have a staging system for this. Not that you guys need to know it, but we, we can get really academic about it. Um, so C0 is you can't tell that they have varicose veins at all. And C6 is an ulcer, right? So veins can go from normal uh, to a big ulcer. This timeline could be 30 to 40 years, okay? So, and the amount of people that become venous ulcer patients is less than 2%, okay? So just because you have a patient with varicose veins doesn't mean they're doomed for having a venous ulcer. It's not at all the case. And, and they may not even progress for the rest of their life. Um, some basic anatomy. The, um, the arteries and the veins are identical. Um, the only exception is the venous system has an extra backup system called the superficial system. That's called the small saphenous vein and the greater saphenous vein, okay? These guys are a backup. Uh, it's, it's almost like you, you were designed to have a DVT and a backup system. So if you had a DVT in your calf, your short saphenous can bypass it or your greater saphenous can bypass it. If you have a DVT in your thigh, your greater saphenous will bypass it and dump it into the common femoral artery. Along those lines, if someone ever has a DVT, they have an absolute contraindication for me doing a vein stripping. I can never ever strip them because their greater saphenous vein is the lifeline for their leg because their deep system is plugged up and that's the anatomy to support that. So some of the pathophysiology review on the left here, you have a normal leg. You got the deep system in between the muscles and the superficial system in under the skin, under the fat, but not in the muscles. And it dives into the deep system through perforators. When you have a venous insufficiency, these valves have broken up with time and now blood is breaking through the perforators and back into uh, the greater saphenous vein and bulging out that way, okay? So that's the kind of simple uh, way to look at venous insufficiency. So next step, ultrasounds. It's gold standard, guys. Ultrasound, everybody with varicose veins, they have really bad varicose veins and you suspect that that classic symptomatology is because of their varicose veins, the gold standard investigation is ultrasound. Um, it has a very accurate mapping of the venous system and of the valvular function. And it can let you know how the deep and superficial system and perforators are working in conjunction and which one's really failing and how do we go about fixing it. Um, so we go back to our rec. Um, there's venous legs, you know, left or right. And then, so even if they have one leg varicose veins, very common for some person to have unilateral varicose veins. We don't know why, it's just the thing. Um, so uh, there it is, it's just three check boxes and away you go, right? So we, we know exactly what we're, we're, we're looking at here. Renter referred to vascular, they have to have three things. Symptoms are consistent with classic venous disease. They made an attempt at wearing compression socks for at least six months. I have yet to meet a patient that has done this. Um, because they're a pain in the ass, and I understand that. Um, so I don't hold them to this. I don't think it's fair. If someone's bought compression socks, they tried it for a little while, and they're like, I hate them, but you tried. And so that's good enough for me. And then ultrasound evidence of incompetence, insufficient, greater saphenous vein, lesser saphenous vein. That's kind of what I'm trying to plug at this talk is what usually happens is I have the first two uh, come to my clinic, and then I order the ultrasound. I don't mind continuing to do that. Uh, that's part of my practice. It's every day for me. But now that you guys are aware of it, you can now start doing it as well. Um, and then you even have your own diagnostic feedback. You think it's secondary to varicose veins. You order the study and look, you have insufficient greater saphenous vein. You were right, right? So it feels kind of good diagnostically to feel that you, you, you caught the diagnosis before the referral. What we do for it, just to keep it simple, you either get surgery, which is covered by OIP, or ablations, which is all these clinics out there do it. You can ablate, but that's private out of pocket. The surgery, basically, I make an incision here at the, the saphenofemoral junction down here at the knee. I literally put a wire across the vein and I disconnect it from the circulation. I put a ball at the end of the wire, a handle down here, and I literally get the medical student to grab the handle and tear it out. Um, they, they think it's great fun. The blood splashes everywhere. But that's a greater saphenous vein stripping. Um, the, that's actually the standard of care operation, and it has really good outcomes. It's just it's a really painful operation. And a little logistical side note, every time COVID shuts down the OR, I'm not allowed to do any vein stripping. So the wait list has built up for everybody in the province um, because COVID um, puts these people on the back burner. Um, the ablation is the same thing. Basically, they freeze the vein down here. You go up with a catheter. You attach the catheter to a uh, machine that barbecues the vein from the inside. So it clots off the vein entirely. Uh, and I'll pass it off to video. This is just an example of the uh, ultrasound study that we do as part of venous insufficiency. So as Michael alluded to, we have to make sure that the patient doesn't have DVTs. Uh, so you have to do a DVT study. And then on top of that, um, 
it actually takes quite a bit of skill to be able to go and map down the greater saphenous vein, lesser saphenous vein, the saphenofemoral junction, uh, and you have to um, try and demonstrate that the valves are actually not competent. So um, what these images are showing on the top, you have the right femoral vein that's in the deep system during Valsalva, there's no retrograde flow, which would be a flow or a waveform above uh, that baseline at the saphenofemoral junction. So this patient actually had a right uh, GSV stripping back in 1990, and they're coming back with left leg symptoms. That's just to show what's going on in the right leg. Down at the bottom left leg, femoral vein, the deep system is fine, but their saphenofemoral junction during Valsalva, lots of flow. Uh, and as you go down further, um, uh, into the greater saphenous vein and uh, all the way down to the knee. So now we can demonstrate that the valves and the these are multiple valves that we're interrogating as we go down. Um, we can actually show the insufficiency, but it's just important to note that this is a technically challenging and time consuming uh, examination uh, to do. So it's just important for patients to kind of uh, understand that. And it also means that you really need good sonographers in order to be able to do good quality uh, venous insufficiency studies, which we are uh, very lucky to have. Thank you. Does anybody have any venous disease questions? Here we go. So Sharon at Seed said, isn't clinically uh, evident varicose veins equal to incompetent valves? Actually, no. Yeah, really good question. Um, I'm, I'm kind of shocked and I agree with you, uh, Sharon, I, I don't know why. Um, well, I do know why, but the, Sometimes um, some people just have primary varicose veins. Uh, primary varicose veins is for whatever reason, the superficial system, the walls that contain the veins are genetically weak. Um, so their main superficial system and their main deep system passes with flying colors. And then for whatever reason, they're still blowing up with these varicose veins everywhere. Um, these patients are actually the hardest to treat because they're born with their superficial, their very small superficial veins being incompetent and dysfunctional. Um, these are the people I paint kind of a grim picture for because I see them and I say, look, your venous ultrasound shows your deep and superficial system are perfectly normal, which means all these veins breaking out will continue to break out for the rest of your life without end. Um, so either you do compression socks or you play venous whack-a-mole and you get them injected every six months until they're all gone away. Um, but to realize it'll be every six months for the rest of your life. So if you ever inherit these patients from another practice where you've seen them getting uh, sclerotherapy every six months for the last decade, um, and then you go back and you find their ultrasound and their ultrasound is normal, that's who these people are. Um, they're the people that have normal major veins, that the very superficial veins are inherently weaker, and they just need sclero or multiple stab avulsions or something small to address their veins at kind of fixed intervals for the rest of their life, or they get compression socks for the rest of their life and they never need anything. Um, so no, just because you see varicose veins doesn't mean the ultrasound is going to show an incompetent valve. <clears throat> so, right, so the last topic is just a little touch on smokers and cannabis because it's all the rage right now. I thought people would be kind of interested in this. So there is a, there's been some work on it recently um, about THC, not so much CBD. So THC has been found to actually have pretty direct cardiovascular effects. Um, so I know everyone in this chat kind of realized, well, if you quit, a lot of people have patients that quit cigarettes, but took up weed and you're like, come on, man, like, you know, like smoking, smoking, right? But they, they don't realize that they actually think they, they achieve something. So just realize that inhaled uh, uh, marijuana, uh, especially still has quite a substantial content of THC. Um, and THC does cause basal spasm, platelet aggregation, and arteritis. Um, so they are still developing their PVD, um, being marijuana smokers uh, versus, versus nicotine smokers. They're still accelerating their PVD. Um, what some of us have found um, just unofficially is they're thrombosing vessels rather than, than developing uh, calcification. Um, so their native arteries look nice and laminar and then boom, something clots off for no reason. We think that has to do with the platelet aggregation side of things. We, we think THC is, is setting off the clotting cascade. There might be a small intimal tear and the whole thing just goes bang. Um, so we don't know why yet. We haven't seen enough of volume to actually make official studies, but the, the, the cardiac journals have published this because they've seen it quite substantially already. Um, and then I guess, uh, oh, there's one more question here. Are there any medications that can help with chronic venous insufficiency? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good one. 
Um, <clears throat> Vinixa. Vinixa was, is a hemorrhoid pill. Uh, it's a pill you take twice a day. It takes three months to have a symptomatic relief. So it actually, you have to tell patients to be patient with uh, Vinixa. Take it twice a day. After three months, it will decrease itchiness and burning pain only itchiness and burning. So if someone complains of leg swelling and heaviness, Vinixa is not for them. Picture hemorrhoids, okay? The same symptoms that are, are, are alleviated from hemorrhoid creams is what Vinixa is doing. And so that's the same symptoms you can expect your lower extremity patients to get relieved. Um, so the guys that have swelling and heaviness, I say for you can drop Vinixa, it's not gonna help you. Um, Vinixa has been proven. The other stuff, um, there's a bunch of stuff, there's like a horse chestnut extract and all that stuff. It does work. Um, I, like any other herbal stuff, you kind of have to take it for a little while and consistently to start seeing it. But it does the same thing as Vinixa. It's an anti, it's an anti white blood cell infiltrator. So it stops the white blood cells from leaving the veins and irritating the skin. Um, so again, it will stop the burning and itchiness only. Nothing helps the swelling and heaviness. So if you're looking for itchiness and burning symptom relief, all these are very reasonable. If you're looking for heaviness and swelling, the, the oral pills won't do it for them. Okay, so final take home message, uh, PVD is a spectrum disease. Um, ultrasound is a great first step in basically every patient. Um, all critical limb ischemia patients should be referred and claudications will be treating on a case by case pay, uh, basis only. CVD is urgent if it's symptomatic, not urgent if asymptomatic. Uh, ultrasound is a great screening tool and extremely accurate. AAA guidelines do indeed exist for Canada and ultrasound surveillance is the gold standard for AAA guidelines. All patients with suspected venous disease should have ultrasound to rule out DVD and assess for venous insufficiency. And then our vascular lab is expertly trained at all of the above. So we're happy to start taking on all these patients and, uh, and uh, we can hopefully save some patients some CTAs. And the last little bit is we can e-consult a lot of these questionable imaging findings. We're happy to clarify everything to, to, to make things more streamlined for you. Uh, Dr. Zelt and I rotate weekly uh, for e-consult. So you'll always get an answer from us. And we usually answer within 24 to 48 hours too. Um, some old services and new services. So what we used to have in Kingston on the left, and in addition, we have now complex aneurysms, thoracic outlets, varicose veins, and connective tissue disease. So uh, we're happy to accept all questions. Uh, both Emilio and I are happy to accept all questions now. And here's our contact information. Uh, the floor is open. Emilio, do you know about uh, Janet Dietrich's question? Uh, Janet asks, can you do urgent referrals to the lab through Ocean or do you have to uh, call? In Ocean, you are able to uh, put a more urgent, yeah, you can rank the urgency on the Ocean referral. Um, uh, yes, so if we, do see a, if we do see a more urgent rec, um, that will be flagged. Um, sometimes we will call directly to discuss it, to see how, you know, do the patient, should they, they go to eMERGE or can we squeeze them in uh, within a reasonable amount of time based on the clinical scenario? But uh, yes, Ocean has those uh, capabilities. Next question was from uh, Daniel Glatt. Maybe Pam can answer this. Pam, are the uh, participants gonna get a copy of our slides? Uh, yes. I can uh, definitely do that. When you registered, you would have provided your email. Uh, so I can make sure that I send a copy of the slides to participants. Um, and as I mentioned, the entire talk will be available on our website within the next few days. Just adds up to some people that have email size restrictions on their like work accounts. It's a 20 megabyte PowerPoint. Uh, Emilio and I just discovered it doesn't even work within our own hospital um, emails. Uh, we had to use Gmail. So just be aware, it's kind of a behemoth of a talk. So what I might try to do is change it into, uh, a, I'll put it in a PDF format. Uh, so there's a few slides on each page and that should cut down the, the size quite a bit. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I don't know, Omar, if you wanted to, Omar or Ben wanted to do an outro or something. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, Ben's a shy one, so I'll, I, th I think he's going to nudge me forward. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, great questions and comments, and thank you to uh, Mike, uh, Emilio, and Kathy. 
wonderful job, really interesting. I hope uh, it was um, very informative for each of our participants and we'll do it again next year, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks guys. Pam, are we able to, uh, it's 6.17, Pam, can we leave the, um, the uh, video going and I can answer people uh, by typing into the chat. Some people still have some questions. Do you mind if I do that? Yeah, no problem. I can leave that okay. open um, and you can uh, either chat or type whatever works for you. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so Violet says, I am a 43-year-old smoker plus smokes marijuana, diabetic on meds with mental health issues. Yeah, that's like... <laughs> This is like half my practice. Um, now that marijuana is very cheap from $220 to 50, he is smoking more. Jeez, counsels him, what can I do? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, there's like this huge, as everyone knows, especially the schizophrenic population, those guys are smokers. And they are PVD patients at the age of 40 and 50, um, especially the diabetic ones. And um, unfortunately, um, I also feel that way when I'm talking about amputation, right? And I and and I do. Lim I'm very aggressive at trying to save legs. So is Emilio. So is Ben. We all try to save legs, um, and we do. We get them in. We admit them from clinic because they're non-compliant, and then we have them on IV antibiotics. We do all these high expensive procedures to salvage legs, and it works. We send them home, and they come back and they throw them both the damn thing because they're chain smoking. And then they end up getting limb loss. Um, so Violet, the long story short is we try our best, but these guys end up losing their legs. I have one on my service right now. And the best part is the home where she came from refuses to take her back because she's an amputee now. So now she's my uh, she she's basically my hospital tenant. Um, so uh, yeah, there's there's no easy answer to that one. Uh, what do you when do you add the Zeralto for claudication? Wow, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. It depends who you talk to, but uh, Zeralto, I'm I'm uh, I'm pro Zeralto um, for anybody that has polyvascular disease. Um, so if I if if I fixed a carotid on a guy and he comes back for PVD, I put him on Zeralto post procedure. Um, the other people I put Zeralto on or anybody I did a major intervention on, like a bypass or something, uh, just because there's a new trial called Voyager that shows post bypass post stenting. Um, patients do better with Zeralto afterwards. Can you, if you have like a bread and butter clodicant that comes in, has no coronary disease, no carotid disease, and they're just a clodicant, the company wants you, they, they say, oh yeah, that's a great indication. I don't think it is. I think it's aggressive. Um, and also keep in mind that the LU code for Zeralto is uh, 539, and that covers plus 65. Um, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I understand. So a lot of my hardcore clodicants are under 65 and they're not going to, the all is expensive. I wouldn't pay for it. Holy hell, it's like a hundred a month um, on top of aspirin, which is like pennies a month, right? So, you know, it, it's not cheap, um, but the plus 65 population with polyvascular disease that has no bleeding risk uh, or a low bleeding risk, um, I put them on, on the dual therapy. And the, the, the LU code makes it very, it's as cheap as aspirin with the LU code. Um, so I actually get good compliance in my plus 65 population. Um, and they don't care. They're like, oh, this is just a pill for my circulation, right? But and they get a bit of uh, uh, bleeding and bruising. Um, but uh, yeah, that's who I add as a to to aspirin. And, and the, con the LU code, by the way, only covers it if they're on ASA 81. And then you add the Zeralto, the Zeralto 2.5 to it because um, that's like the, the trial um, uh, combination. Um, just be aware that if, even if you move your practice to a different part of Ontario or something, every vascular surgeon is starting to go in this direction because we hate it when our bypasses go down. We hate it when our stents go down and Zeralto looks like it's keeping them open for a little longer. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, is there any role for pentoxifiline or celastazole? Wow, you guys are killing it today. Um, yeah, so <laughs> yes, there is. Um, pentoxifiline, I like... Um, it's a good medication. It is very, very hard on the GI system. So I, if someone can tolerate it and they have claudication, it's a fantastic medication. If they cannot tolerate for GI reasons, you end up having to stop it anyway. We're talking about a few percentage in symptom improvement. We're talking about like a 5% improvement in symptoms. So we're not, it's not like we're denying this guy uh, a, a symptom-free life. We're not. We're reducing it about 5%, but you know, some people want that 5% to avoid surgery. Um, Solostazole, yeah, definitely. Pletol is the best, one of the best medications, the only uh, PVD uh, medication that's really 
uh, strongly indicated. But as far as the last I remember, Slossazole is actually still unobtainable in uh, Canada. We, I think they make it in Sudbury and then uh, and then it goes to the US and then we can't get it back or something stupid like that. In Ottawa, we used to send a, a, all our patients across the border to get their Solostazole scripts and then they come back. And that's how we got people on Solostazole. It's Pletol, right? So that's the, that's the funny thing about Solostazole. If you can get it for your patients, great. I think it's, it's a fantastic. Okay. I think Mike and Amido, you could go on for hours talking vascular. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, this is it's like my only opportunity to talk to these guys. <laughs> I don't get to talk to them a lot. That's great. They all, have, they all have very good questions too. <laughs> I'm like digging deep. I'm like, what did I read about that? You know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take up any more time. You're right. I'll, I'll cut it off, Omar. <laughs> Uh, I, I think, you know, if there were any more questions, we would, but uh, I, I think uh, that's it for now. Uh, so everyone has uh, or will have the emails for both Mike and Emilio. So uh, as they said, feel free to um, send any comments or questions uh, our way. And, and also any suggestions you may have for any future talks would be, I'm, I'm putting words in the mouth of Emilio and Mike, but we'd be happy to uh, arrange a future talk if required. Uh, um, um, so thank you very much everyone for attending and uh, joining us for this really informative session now I'm going to say have a good night <laughs> bye bye